Hi, I'm Lisa Everett, a staff attorney at Houston Volunteer Lawyers. I want to thank everyone for joining us today for the CLE being presented by Jessica, who's going to talk about um, about what <laughs> probate options when someone dies without a will other than an independent administration and determination of heirship. And um, we will take questions during the CLE. Um, you can post them in the chat or the Q&A. I will be monitoring that. Unless I know that Jessica will be addressing it later on, um, I will interrupt and uh, she'll take questions during the CLE. And I, the CLE information is posted in the chat. I will post it again at the end and I'll let Jessica take it from here and let you introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's nice to meet everyone virtually as it is. Uh, my name is Jessica Guabadia. I'm an attorney with Yance Guabadia Law Firm in Montgomery County. I practice primarily in Montgomery and Harris County. We handle a lot of probates and guardianships and estate planning matters for our clients. Um, I am going to be honest with you. Actually, the stuff we're talking about today um, are some of the topics that when we're talking to clients, it's our least favorite because the clients have always heard of them and they think of it as a, as a, a cheaper or easier way than a probate or um, an administration, but they don't really realize the pitfalls. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen to get started. Just bear with me for one second. Okay, so taking the easy way out when people die without a will, wait too long to probate a will or other options just don't work. Small estate affidavits and affidavits of airship. Um, so what we're dealing with today um, is you guys are gracious enough to take on some HBLP volunteer pro bono cases. Um, and what you're gonna find out is a lot of times people did in fact die without a will. Um, and that can be problematic in some instances. Um, the good news for everyone here is that if you're taking a case from HBLP, most likely the case has been pretty well vetted um, and you'll you'll know the pitfalls before you go into it. And hopefully there are none because I know HBLP tries to make our um, volunteer cases a little bit more straightforward and easier to control. Um, the other thing is that you'll most likely be practicing in Harris County. So one thing I would always encourage anyone who takes an HBLP case to do is look at the Harris County Probate Courts website to see if they have anything on what you're trying to file. For example, um, the Harris County Courts website has a lot of information on small estate affidavits. Um, some courts might prefer that form to other forms. So familiarize with yourself with the court, with the staff and, and what that court wants you to do. Also included on this front page are the uh, is the CLE information. Um, so if you didn't get it in the chat, it's right here as well. And I did tell um, Lisa that we would be willing to send the PowerPoint around um, in a PDF form after the presentation is over if anybody is interested. Okay, so what, what do we do when we have a client who has a family member who died without a will, but maybe the estate's not big enough or to justify a determination of heirship with a pen, uh, independent administration? So really, what you need to do is assess your client's goals. Are they trying to access bank accounts and life insurance policies, transfer property, but continue to live there? Um, are they trying to seek governmental assistance to rebuild the property from the city of Houston or their county? Are they trying to clear up tax issues? Or are they trying to transfer title and immediately sell the property? Once you can identify your client goals, um, it will go a long way in determining what's of the following options, if any, are appropriate for their particular case. And before we start, I do want to caution you as well, especially when you're dealing with banks, every bank is going to be different and each legal counsel is going to have their own interpretation of Texas law, especially if you're dealing with a bank that's say in New York or California or wherever. Um, so they may not be familiar with Texas law. So I always encourage people to have the statute ready to send when you're taking any of the following steps. When you first meet with your clients, their family member didn't have a will. Um, one of the first questions you're actually going to want to ask is in addition to, 
did they have a will is, okay, fine, they didn't have a will, but did they have a safe deposit box? They're not as popular as they used to be, but they people still use them occasionally. Um, and safe deposit box, can cause somewhat of an issue if you're trying to see if there is a will, if, you're, if you've conducted a diligent search. Um, and they can also present an issue to access life insurance policies um, as well as burial policies. So getting into a safe deposit box, if someone doesn't have a key or otherwise have authorized access to it, can be difficult. Um, chapter 151 of the Texas Estates Code is going to tell you how to be able to examine those documents and you can either do it with or without a court order. In HBLP cases, my understanding is typically you're going to try to want to do it with at least the least amount of court intervention as, as possible, if, if that's possible at all. Um, but what you, what you need to know as the HBLP pro bono attorney is that your client cannot remove the contents of a decedent safe deposit box except as otherwise provided by chapter 151 or another law. Um, if they were to just show up at the bank and demand access to the safe deposit box, whoever's at the bank is probably going to tell them absolutely not and to go get a court order. Fortunately, that's not always required. I am going to actually start backwards in the, start of the statute and discuss when you don't need a court order so if your client is the decedent's spouse, parent, adult descendant of the decedent, um, or the person named as the executor in a testamentary document, if you have one, they can examine the documents of the safe deposit box. If they go this route, when, you, when they go in and look at what's in the safe deposit box, um, they're gonna have to be in the presence of a bank agent um, or officer of the bank. Um, they can't just go in there, take a look at what's in the box, take things out, remove it, um, because as the person examining it, they, they are going to have to potentially report back to the court or the, the bank itself or whoever owns or controls the box is going to have a duty to advise the court of what's in the box. So if your client is the spouse, parent, or child, adult child of the decedent, they can probably go into the safe deposit box without a court order. It sounds simple, but again, you you need to remember that when you're dealing with banks, you're gonna get a lot of pushback because they're gonna talk about privacy laws. They're gonna talk about how this particular branch has never heard of this law. Um, their legal counsel in New York doesn't recognize the law because New York doesn't recognize it. So be prepared to be patient and be prepared to present the statutory authority that allows you to access it. Um, we've had cases where it was an, a parent of a, a child who passed away and all he wanted was this, his son's dog tags. That's all that was in the safe deposit box. Um, so it, it sometimes takes a little phone conversation or a visit to the bank um, to get the bank to comply with the statute, but most of the time it is possible. Um, now, if you're going to examine the safe deposit box without a court order, the bank can give the documents to that person in, in some instances, if the person requests it and the bank issues a receipt for the document. Um, if there's a will though, that will, just like if we as attorneys hold the will or and we know that the client died, we deposit with the clerk of court, that will that's found in the safe deposit box must be deposited with the clerk of court um, or, to, or you could do it to the executor as well. Um, and the bank must actually keep a copy of the will until the fourth anniversary of the date of the delivery of the will to the person they've given it to. Um, so again, in this case, we're in, for the purpose of the CLE, we're assuming that there was no will, but if one is discovered, know that your client would have the duty to present it to the clerk of court or the executor. Um, if there is a burial policy, then the bank must give that to the person who is there looking through the safe deposit box. Um, if there's an insurance policy, it has to be given to the beneficiary named in the policy. Um, and the bank should be keeping a copy of the delivered documents. And you as counsel, I would encourage you to keep a copy of the documents as well. 
um, just so you have a record of what your client was given. Um, so if you're able to access the safe deposit box without a court order, that's great. You should be able to move, on, move along quite quickly. Um, again, that's not always going to be possible. It may just come to down to the fact that um, the bank is being difficult and they won't comply with the statute. It, it happens, again, more often than not, so just be prepared for that. If you have to get a court order to enter a safe deposit box, you need to go into the court that has probate jurisdiction of the estate. Um, and then the court will appoint a court representative, it could be your client, to examine what's in the box. Um, again, they're, the representative's looking for a will, a deed to the burial plot, or an insurance policy um, in the decedent's name and payable to a beneficiary. And the documents must be examined in the, I'm sorry, um, the documents must be examined in the presence of another. Um, and so again, you're, you're gonna be bound by reporting duties when your client finds certain documents. Um, the court can allow your client or the court representative to take possession of the will, the burial policy and the insurance policy. Um, and same as if there's no court order, if there's a will, it must be delivered to the clerk of the court. Again, this is common practice for us as attorneys if we have a will of somebody who passed away. Um, think of it as no different than that. Um, the burial plot policy must be given to the person designated by the judge as the court representative. And an insurance policy must be given to a beneficiary. So this is the first step of determining if there's a will or a policy. Now, if you get an insurance policy, but there's no will, the question then becomes, well, how do we access that insurance policy if there's if it's just left to the estate? Or um, if there are bank accounts that are out there and you don't wanna open the estate, can you access those funds? Um, and the answer is maybe without a court order. Well, maybe without an administration or a judicial determination of heirship. Um, I'm sure all of you know the definition of intestate is dying without a will. Um, I'm not sure of the statistics, but last I checked, I think it was something like at least 50% of the US population doesn't have an estate plan. Um, so it should come of no shock that this is going to be a common request for um, your clients. And so speaking in the broader scheme of things, something that I said at the beginning still holds true. Um, clients love to Google what options they have. Um, and so if they go to Texas Law Help or I don't know, LegalZoom or what have you, they'll often come up with a list of options of what's the cheapest to the most expensive ways to distribute in a state where there is no will. And a small state affidavit or an affidavit of airship might come up. So remember, you're going to be educating your clients about the benefits and disadvantages of these options and how these options may or may not be a one size fits all solution for them. Um, the first thing I want to talk to you about is the small estate affidavit. These are pretty common for access to bank accounts, life insurance policies, and sometimes the decedent's homestead. One thing about the small estate the affidavit statute that I harp on is that it's filled with uh, loopholes and exceptions and the application is not as straightforward as an attorney would hope it would be since it was put in place to help avoid probate for smaller uh, estates. Um, so when you're going through and completing a small estate affidavit, I would encourage you to go back and review the statute, unless you do it every day. I would review the statute every time you do it. Um, 
I think the last major change was in 2017, but I always get the years mixed up. Um, so if you're doing a small estate affidavit, please go back and review the statute. I'm gonna walk you through it a little bit, but the statute is not user-friendly. Um, so chapter 205 of the Texas Estates Code allows um, an estate to be distributed to the intestate heirs um, without waiting for the appointment of a personal representative. This is a wonderful option um, for estates that do not exceed $75,000. Um, and that's excluding homestead and exempt property. But you have to remember that at least 30 days must have passed since the date of the decedent's death to be eligible for a small estate affidavit. There also must not have been any petition for an appointment of a personal representative or none must have been granted. Um, the assets must exceed the liabilities in these cases. So that's something that comes up a lot with small estate affidavits. You'll, your client will swear that the assets exceeded the liabilities. You'll do the small estate affidavit. Everything will be granted. Everything will look golden. Three months later, you find out that mom or dad had a $50,000 American Express bill and only $20,000 in the estate. Um, the other thing that sometimes happens with a small estate affidavit is that there will be a will that's discovered later or a will that was never probated and you'll have to go um, file a bill of review to get the, the probate reopened and the small estate affidavit set aside. So a small estate affidavit is limited in scope but can cause issues down the road. Um, if the client meets those requirements, 30 days have passed since the date of death, there's no other um, personal representative pending or granted, the estate's under $75,000, then you file the affidavit with the, pro the, the appropriate court. Um, the judge, most of the time, approves the affidavit, um, and then your clients comply with the affidavit. This is one of those documents that Harris County probate clerk courts do have online. If I'm filing in Harris County, even if I'm using Westlaw Forms or ProDocs or whatever your program is, I always make sure it complies with what the Harris County probate courts have on file to make sure that it's complying with what they want to see. Um, if you practice in the Harris County probate courts a lot or even a little, you probably have noticed that they're very particular on their, their documents sometimes. So if it's a form document, then try to comply with the local court's preference for those documents as much as possible. Um, the affidavit requirements for a small estate affidavit can sometimes prove to be difficult, especially if it's an elderly person or somebody with minimal family. Um, so the affidavit must be sworn to by two disinterested witnesses. Um, if the disinterested witnesses are related to the decedent, I always encourage people to include the nature of the relationship to the decedent and that they are disinterested from the estate and not claiming any portion of the estate to make it clear to the court that they are truly disinterested. Um, Jessica, I always, yes. Sorry to interrupt. This is actually my question because that's not part of any standard form. You're just adding additional language like my name is, my relationship is, and I am completely disinterested. Yes. So if it's a disinterested witness, witness that is, um, is a relative, so it's their niece, their grandparent, however you, whoever it is, I, I always encourage it to be included because the last thing I want to do is to have the court find out later that they were a relationship, there was a relationship, they were family, um, and for it to unravel for that reason. Um, I would much prefer to be open and honest with the court at the outset. And of course, just because you're related to somebody doesn't mean you have an interest in the estate necessarily, especially if it's a parent with children and you're looking at the, um, the parent's siblings, for example. Um, we've had cases where um, somebody offered up a witness and when I talked to the witness, the, uh, the witness said, oh, well, Johnny promised me half the land would be mine after he passed away. He wasn't related to Johnny, but 
the fact that he had in his head that Johnny had promised him the land on death made it possible that he could make a claim against the estate. So we had to find a new witness. So I'm a little more cautious with this because I think having an even a possibly interested witness could unravel a small estate affidavit or as they talk later, an affidavit of heirship. Um, so the, uh, the affidavit of, I'm sorry, the small estate affidavit also has to be signed by each distributee of the estate who has legal capacity or the natural guardian of any minor or the guardian of an incapacitated person. Um, it must meet the requirements that we just talked about that um, the estate, so you have to list that the estate is under $75,000, 30 days have passed, no probate pending. Um, the affidavit also must list all the known estate assets and liabilities. Um, and again, this, is, this can be problematic because people don't always know what mom or dad's liabilities look like. Um, and then, so you need to make sure you have that conversation have you received any uh, credit card statements? Have they received any, um, you know, Macy's furniture um, statement saying that they owe a balance to Macy's for the furniture they bought a year ago? Um, what about vehicles? So you're always wanting to make sure that you have an idea of what the assets and liabilities are. Um, and then if you're claiming that any of the assets are exempt, you must indicate which assets you're claiming are exempt. And then you must include the name and address of each distributee um, and the relevant family history facts concerning the heirship that shows the distributee's right to the estate property. Um, think when you're writing out a determination of heirship order, that's, that's what you're gonna wanna show the court is who is entitled to the estate property, what are they entitled to, and the name and address of each of them. And make sure that each distributee signs the small estate affidavit. This is also another, can be another um, problematic area for a small estate affidavit because if you need the distributees to all sign off on it, um, there are occasions when one or two may not because they think they're entitled to more of the estate than what they're claiming, um, or I'm sorry, than what's in indicated in the affidavit. So again, at the very outset, have that talk with your clients, make sure that they've truly talked to the other heirs to make sure that the heirs will be on board with signing the small estate affidavit, because you don't necessarily want to go through all of the work of gathering the information, preparing the document only for them to say, oh, well, my brother won't sign off on this. Um, you'll also file an order with a small estate affidavit for the judge to approve the affidavit. It typically, the beauty of the small estate affidavit is once it's filed with the order, it typically only takes a couple of weeks, three to four weeks at most for the order to be signed and for your client to go get the affidavit. Um, once you have the affidavit, you'll need to get a copy, a certified copy of the order and a certified copy of the affidavit. Um, more than likely, you're gonna need more than one copy of the order and the affidavit. So you just reach out to the, the county clerk, um, get the certified order for them, um, and then the certified copy of the application. And that's when you can start using the, applica the application, I'm sorry, the small state affidavit and the order to access the bank accounts, life insurance policies, and um, possibly transfer the homestead. Um, the copies of the small estate affidavit would go to anybody who owes money to the estate um, or has custody or possession of the state property. Um, again, it might take for a bank or a life insurance policy to release the funds. What I've had some of them tell my clients is they need a letter from me on my letterhead with a copy of the certified orders. Um, I, I don't know why that copy of the letterhead makes much of a difference because if we're being honest um, in this day and age, anybody can make a letterhead that looks like it's from a law firm, but it seems to make them feel better. Um, you know, I think too, they just like to be able to pick up the phone and call us and say, hey, what's going on? Um, So-and-so is coming to pick up the check. This is 
you know, is this for real? Um, now, once that's brought to the bank again, or, or the life insurance policy, my experience, and this is going to vary based on the company or the bank, is that the life insurance policy will cut checks to each heir in the proportion indicated by the, um, by the small estate affidavit. So they might send the checks directly to those beneficiaries. They might send the checks to you to distribute to the, to, I'm sorry, to the heirs. Um, it's really going to depend on the bank and what they're most comfortable with. Um, my experience typically has been that they send it directly to the listed heirs. Um, and then it, the, the account's closed out, the life insurance policy is paid out. Um, if you're transferring homestead property, then the small estate affidavit and order would have to be filed in the county clerk's records where the, um, the property is filed to make sure that the title company later on can find it. Um, Jessica, may I interrupt yes. you again with my own question? Yes. Um, do, how often do the courts accept the small estate affidavit by submission? How often do they require a hearing? It's going to depend on what court you're in. Um, I've not been to a hearing on a small estate affidavit, to be perfectly honest. Um, the only reason that I think that you might have one is if the judge thought that there was a potential issue in the small estate affidavit. Um, Fair enough. But most of the time, the coordinators well, would call you and say, hey, you're missing something. I can tell you I've had that happen to me before where someone asked me to correct something. Uh, I think that we've mentioned this in the last two probate CLEs, you know, last Friday and the Friday before. The probate courts are really friendly and really helpful. They don't just reject you. They'll often tell you, or if they reject it, they'll tell you why. And I find that super, super helpful. And just for reference, in my case, it was because I included real property. I put something in there about how it wasn't being transferred. It was still under the $75,000, but they told me to remove it. And so um, we took it out. Yeah. No, the, so that is one thing Harris and Montgomery alike. Um, the coordinators, the clerks are worth their weight in gold. <laughs> um, so be polite to them, please. They will walk you through anything, but I never want to get on the wrong side of them because they're doing their job, right? Um, and I want to help them help me <laughs> selfishly. Um, plus 99% of them are super pleasant and, and just very kind and generous with their time. So yeah, um, you know, I think Lisa, there might also be a hearing obviously if somebody or depending on what happens if somebody filed a controverting affidavit or or if something like that came up. Um, I've not had that happen, but that's the other time that I can envision that. Um, I also think, just so you know, I think there's a lot of pro, you can technically do a small estate affidavit and SEA stands for a uh, small estate affidavit. You can technically do it pro se, but the Harris County courts have told us that they reject most of them. And I can see why, because sometimes people will apply with this afterwards and they will sign as the disinterested, like the, the one heir will sign as the disinterested witness. They won't have any disinterested witnesses. I mean, there's, they'll list property that can't be probated. I had someone list more debts than assets. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just like, so, uh, but with attorneys, with attorneys, I think it's much less, uh, much more, less likely to happen because we are, because we understand the rules and we're following them to the best of our ability. Um. Yeah, and I think, you know, I'm sure people roll their eyes when I say I read the statute every time whenever I deal with a small estate affidavit, but it's for those reasons, right? They're just, it's not something you do every day. Um, there's no court oversight and the legislature, basically, if you've read the statute, you know, the legislature basically made um, a choose your own adventure <laughs> on what to do with certain property. Um, so I can't imagine a person without an attorney navigating it, even using the Harris County forums, the Texas law help forums, um, or, or the assistance of somebody familiar with it, because there's a lot of ways to just um, really miss the statutory requirements. Or, um, and, and I will add this to you, you make a good point. Check the local rules, the local, um, court preferences, the local guidelines to make sure that you have everything that that particular judge wants. Because if you're not in Harris County and you're in a smaller county, it's kind of up for grabs on 
what they're looking for. Um, they're used to seeing it one way. And if they see something out of place, um, then they may kick it out for that reason. Um, something else that you should consider including in your small estate affidavit is a Medicaid estate recovery plan certificate if they've received Medicaid. If they did not receive Medicaid, you might put in there that the decedent did not receive Medicaid, just to make it clear to the court that there's no possibility of a MERP claim. Um, and, and that just makes it much more clear for everybody involved. Um, and, it, and it might assist you with the um, matter not getting kicked out of court um, because it wasn't in there. And then the other thing that's important for you and your clients to know, and, and this is more of a client-centered issue, um, is undisclosed heirs. If there are heirs that are un not disclosed in the small estate affidavit and there's real property that's sold, then that undisclosed heirs might have a claim against the disclosed heirs that received a portion of the proceeds. Um, you know, back in law school, we learned about bona fide purchasers. The small state of affidavit gets filed. Somebody buys the house and title approves it based on the small state affidavit. That bona fide purchaser is most likely going to be protected, but the disclosed heirs who took a piece of the proceeds probably will not be and will be liable to the, um, to the undisclosed heirs. So again, like anything else, honesty, being upfront. Um, and if your clients aren't sure if they're able to name all of the heirs, the small estate affidavit is probably not the best option. Um, and of course, a small estate affidavit doesn't affect disposition of a property under a will or other testamentary document. Um, so Overall, the small estate affidavit can be really helpful for things like the bank accounts and life insurance policies. And it can also be helpful for homestead in certain in instances. So this is another key part of the statute that I think this would be a reason for it to get kicked back to you. Um, this, is, this would be a reason for the judge to possibly um, not approve the affidavit is the small estate affidavit only transfers title to homestead property. Um, and if the decedent's homestead is the only real property in the estate, then title to the homestead may be transferred under the affidavit that meets the requirements of chapter 205. Um, if the decedent has other real property, you're going to have to look at whether or not, well, first of all, if they had other real property, then they probably wouldn't meet the $75,000 threshold, um, but you're gonna have to look at other options. Um, maybe it's a small state affidavit combined with an affidavit of airship, which we'll discuss in a bit. Maybe they do just need to go ahead and do the administration and determination of airship just to make sure that the property can be properly sold. Um, but homestead, for the purpose of small state affidavit, um, the, this is, and this is the choose your own adventure part, right? Um, the chapter 205 directs you to estates codes 353051. Um, so if you're trying to transfer a homestead under a small estate affidavit, you really can only use this um, for the use and benefit of a decedent surviving spouse and minor children. This does not apply to any unmarried adult children living with the decedent's family, which makes sense to me, but it also doesn't apply to an incapacitated adult child of the decedent, um, which quite frankly doesn't make sense to me because if it's an incapacitated adult child that's living with the decedent, they, 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 they're not protected under the small estate affidavit statute. Um, so just remember when you're talking the homestead transfer, it's only for the surviving spouse and only for the minor children. Um, outside of that, the small estate affidavit's not going to work for your clients. Um, and then the other thing that you can transfer um, is exempt property. Again, chapter 205 directs you to chapter 353 of the estates code. Um, and that the exempt property applies to the surviving spouse, the minor children, 
um, unmarried adult children remaining with the decedent's family, and then also the incapacitated adult child of the decedent. Now, chapter 353 then directs you to chapter 42, the Texas Property Code. I included the list in here um, because some of this is just so very Texas. Um, <clears throat> you know, farming or ranching vehicles are considered exempt. Um, tools or equipment used in a trade or profession to firearms, athletic and sporting equipment. The statute actually does have a parentheses of including bicycles in that. So I assume somewhere there was a fight over this. Um, certain animals and forage on hand for their consumption, to consumption, but only up to two horses, mules or donkeys, um, 12 head of cattle, 60 head of other livestock, um, 120 fowl household pets. So the exempt property that under the small estate affidavit is, is very limited um, to pretty much things that would contribute to the family's ongoing um, ability to provide for themselves. Um, the ATVs are also included in there. I, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm sure somebody had an ATV that wasn't and they were upset and they petitioned the legislature for that one. That's the one that kind of, you know, doesn't really fit in there. Um, so when you're talking to your clients about what the small estate affidavit can transfer outside of the bank account or um, the life insurance policy, it really truly is a limited option. Um, and I think that clients need to understand that. Um, HBLP clients might be a little bit easier because again, HBLP has vetted the case. If it's a private client coming in, they've probably Googled it and said, this, this solves all my problems. Can we just do this? Um, so just make sure that when you're explaining the small estate affidavit, you really narrow in on how limited that option is for your client. Um, if the decedent has property that's not homestead, or if the heirs are um, adult children, for example, you're probably going to have to use an affidavit of heirship. Now, again, I caution affidavits of heirship outside the context of looking for um, transferring the property to clear up tax foreclosures, um, to assist with transferring the property, to um, seek governmental benefits to help rebuild with the city of Houston, for example, or Harris County or other counties. Um, the affidavit of heirship is something that has its time and place but it's also something that can um, make title, clearing title a little bit more difficult at the back end. Um, my general rule of thumb is if my client thinks that they're going to live in this property for the next 10, 15, 20, 25 years because it's a family property, then an affidavit of heirship may be the way to go. Um, but if they're thinking that they're gonna to try to sell the property in the next five years or so, I, I typically try to caution them against the affidavit of heirship and would recommend even if you did a deter, uh, judicial determination of heirship and filed that in the county clerk's records, even if you don't do a full administration. Um, it typically helps with title when you go to sell the property, especially if, they, especially if it's within uh, the next five years. And this is found in chapter 203 of the Texas Estates Code. Um, affidavits of heirship must be signed and notarized. Um, that's something that I think, again, a lot of people with COVID have gotten somewhat used to doing an unsworn declaration. Um, make sure these are notarized. And then it. I've not used remote online notarization. Um, what we've been doing instead is if we have somebody who can't get to us or get to a notary, um, we've been able to arrange for rem remote traveling notaries to go to them. And it's, it's really been a great option right now uh, to make sure that everybody has access to notary, but that's obviously not um, an, an option for everybody. Um, the affidavit of airship is a statutorily prescribed form pretty much. Um, two to three disinterested witnesses and the signature of each distributee. Um, and again, it must be filed with the county clerk's um, office in the real property records to make sure that the property is transferred. Um, 
some of the considerations when you're determining whether or not an affidavit of airship is the best option is that title companies vary on their acceptance of affidavits of airship um, and AOH. Um, recently, I was on a talk with a title company fee attorney, and she said that if she sees an if she sees an affidavit of airship, she'll tell um, them that they need to go get a judicial determination of airship. Um, now, I recently actually had a friend use an affidavit of airship because uh, her mother passed away within like a year, um, and we buy ugly houses had them do it. Um, but you know, those, those sorts of, uh, wholesalers don't particularly care about the chain of title. Um, they just fix it somehow on the back end. Um, the affidavit of airship. Hey Jess, I, I think we yeah. lost you for just a second, just so you know. Oh, sorry. Are you there? Yes. Okay. Or maybe it's mine. Sorry. Um, Oh, sorry. Um, and I just saw a question come through. It says one of the things that we've discovered is the homestead and exempt property only applies if there's a surviving spouse or minor child, adult child living with the decedent. Yes, that's absolutely correct. Um, and this is going back to the small estate affidavit. I apologize. I just saw the note. Um, but the homestead does not apply to adult child living with the decedent, only the exempt property would. So the um, homestead applies to the surviving spouse or minor child and the adult child living with the decedent can access the exempt property. So I apologize for missing that question. Um, so going back to the affidavits of airships, um, they don't affect the rights of admitted heirs or creditors. Um, and so if somebody is omitted, just be aware that they could have a claim against the person who filed it and received proceeds if it's sold. Um, this slide gives you the basic requirements of the affidavit signed before a notary, um, name and address of an affiant who's familiar with and has personal knowledge of the family history of the decedent, um, the dates they knew the decedent, decedent's residence at the time of death, their marital history. For each marriage and divorce, I always encourage people to include the date of marriage and the date of divorce. And if you have it, include the cause number of the divorce. So it's easy to look up. Um, decedent's descendants, and if they don't have descendants, their heirs, um, which would be their parents. And if it's only one surviving parent, it would be then parent, the surviving parent plus their siblings. Um, names of persons familiar with the decedent's family history. This is optional according to the statute. Um, it doesn't hurt to include it and you'll see why in a second. Um, include that the decedent died without leaving a written will. However, an AOH can be used if there was a will. Um, you just attach the will to it and modify that there was a will. The will supports the information included in the affidavit of heirship and that the will gave the property to uh, his son, Johnny. Um, it, there, again, there must be no administration of the decedent's estate, uh, no debts that are unpaid, but then you list them, except um, no unpaid estate taxes, the same. Um, the, the nature of the real property interest. Uh, the heirs of the decedent is optional, but again, I suggest you include it. Um, and then you can include additional information like the size of the decedent's estate. And if the decedent didn't receive Medicaid, I get, again would put that in there just to make it clear. Um, so basically think whatever you would put into your judicial declaration of, of airship, that's what you wanna see in the airship affidavit. Um, so here's the issue with the affidavit of airship from a title company standpoint. Um, title companies can promulgate their own rules relating to affidavits of airship and when and if they're going to accept them. Um, I, and I cannot think of the attorney names, the attorney's name, but Lone Star Land Law has a great piece on affidavits of airship in Texas. And I, I, I his blog posts are, have always been very helpful. So I would encourage anybody to go and take a look at his work. Um, but some title companies will not accept AOH for sale, um, requiring the judicial determination of airship. 
And this will vary company to company and just depends on what they're looking for, okay? Um, some of the requirements that they have is that the decedent must have died at least six months prior to the execution of the affidavit. Um, the title company might require the death certificate be provided to them. So if you're preparing an affidavit of airship for a client, you might consider telling them to keep a copy of the death certificate um, in the event that they sell the property so they don't have to go request a new one. Um, the affidavit must be signed by at least two disinterested witnesses who knew the decedent for at least 10 years. Um, again, if related to the decedent, disclose that information. Um, the affidavit must be signed by all heirs taking title pursuant to the intestacy statute. Um, this, this, this is a big one. The affidavit must match with the title company's examination. Um, and then if the will hasn't, if there is a will and hasn't been probated, attached to the affidavit and support facts asserted in the affidavit. And then some title companies require a perjury clause. So when you're drafting an affidavit of heirship, not only is it important for you to look at the statutory requirements, but I would also encourage you to take this list or whatever list that you've got from the title company or any title company that you're using and, and include their requirements to try to preempt any future issues for your clients. Um, on the next slide, I have included the sample perjury clause. Um, it's basically that, you know, the pains and penalties of perjury um, and the person signing it understands that this could be a criminal offense, could be fraud. Um, the title companies that I've worked with on affidavits of airship have rejected affidavits of airship when this language is not included in there. Um, so is it required by statute? No, but is it good practice? Yes. So something else um, before we move on to adverse possession is with the affidavits of airship, they're not presumed to be prima facie evidence until they've been on file for five years. So again, they're great if your client doesn't look isn't looking to sell the property in the next few years, if they're gonna hold it long-term, but if they're looking to sell the property relatively soon, then I, again, would caution against the use of the affidavit of airship um, because if there's an adverse claim, it's not considered uh, prima facie evidence. And after five years, there's been at least one court that said that the evidence to overcome the affidavit of airship would be summary judgment evidence. So the longer your client's going to hold on to the property, the better chance you have or your client has of the affidavit of airship being held to be um, an appropriate means of transfer of the property. The final thing I'm gonna mention fairly quickly um, is adver adverse possession by a co-tenant heir. Um, Lisa and I were talking about this yesterday um, and you know, she mentioned that one of the things that people try to use as a claim to um, the property is that they've been paying the, the tax, the taxes on the property. Um, but the statute's pretty clear that the possessing co-tenant heir must pay all property taxes on the property not later than two years after the date the taxes come due. Um, so before you even consider whether this is an option, that's going to always be the first question. And Lisa, correct me if I'm wrong, they should be able to go pull that information from the Harris County Appraisal District or the County Appraisal District, right? So once it's paid off, I don't know that it actually shows when it was paid. Um, we might be able to do a TPI request on behalf of the cotent heir. A lot of people actually, if they have been paying the records, keep their records. And I apologize, there's a jackhammer outside my window. <laughs> You're fine. Um, Okay, so yeah, I mean, to ask the client, um, sometimes I've had luck with the county appraisal districts where they'll just give me information <laughs> when I call them. Not all, not all are that friendly. Um, but, you know, the, the co-tenant heir must have continuous uninterrupted 10-year period immediately preceding the filing of the affidavits. Um, and no other co-tenant heir can have contributed to the tax or maintenance. They must not have challenged the possession of the property, asserted a claim against it. Um, and the affidavit must be filed in the county clerk's records. Um, so I'm not sure from HBLP standpoint, but I'm not, so Lisa, how often do these come up in your practice? At it has never come up how, I mean, that where someone has qualified. Um, I actually, 
have talked to some people where maybe they're the only ones living there and they are the only ones maintaining the property. And right now we're going to help them with an affidavit of heirship because they're not on good terms with the other co-heirs. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling them, if you make sure you always pay the property taxes in 10 years, if you come back and reapply with us, because you've already been doing it for five years, if you want to come back to us in 10 years, we can reevaluate this at this time to see if we can actually get like title in your name, because you're the only one that's maintained the property since mom died. Okay. So, you know, I, I, I just don't see this as becoming an issue, but, you know, Lisa just gave an example of when it might be. Um, and I think that's especially true with the, the, you know, the 23A, the property code 23A um, petition to partition property that inherited property. So just keep this one in your back pocket for the rare case that it could come up um, because you never know. Um, the adverse possession affidavit must be filed separately or combined with the um, affidavit of airship. It must include the legal description of the real property um, and then an attestation that each affiance, a co-tenant heir with the requirements that it's been peaceable and exclusive, 10 years, um, evidence of payment of all property taxes, and no action by other co-tenant heir during the preceding 10 years. Um, the co-tenant heir has five years to file suit or file a controverting affidavit. And after those five years, um, the title can vest in, in your clients if, if they meet the requirements. Um, so again, my take on these options is that these are great options if they fit the narrow circumstances <laughs> that they're intended to fit. Um, but I do think that they are, they can be, um, traps for the unaware. Um, you know, I, I think most of the attorneys on this CLE are probably pretty aware of, of issue spotting and advising their clients. Um, I think the biggest problem that I see probably across all areas of law at this point is a client's uh, relentless rely reliance on Google or, you know, whatever, whatever the search engine of the day is to tell them what legal advice they should be following. Um, and that's what I have on the uh, what to do when you don't have a will. Um, and you're not looking for a judicial determination of airship. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just gonna hop in for just a second. I'm, we're encouraging everyone who's attending these CLEs to take an HVL case, probate, or any other type of case. Uh, you can log on to see what cases are available at hvl.legalserver.org. You can also contact our pro bono coordinators, Ellie or Kelly. Their information is here. Um, we do provide forms for probate matters. Uh, we have the probate manual, the forms in the probate manual, the instructions of the probate, the entire probate manual. And we also provide access to text docs, which is a, uh, it was founded by the same guy who created ProDocs. So uh, just be aware that we really, really would like all y'all to take the case. We'll also, you know, mentor you if you have questions. We do try to vet these cases beforehand. So for these types of cases, um, before we put it into referral, I'm asking who's going to be the two disinterested witnesses. You know, are they related? How are they related? I want to make sure, um, I don't like grandkids if like it, I don't like a child of a person who's an heir doing it. I always want it to be someone more distant. It just, we try to like prep that beforehand. We ask for the list of all the heirs and their addresses and contact information. Basically, um, we wanna make sure they can provide it to us so they can give it to you and you're reviewing information and verifying it's, uh, verifying that it's correct with the client. Next slide, please. Uh, also, we have a medical legal partnership, and a lot of the cases that we get from that are guardianships. Um, it's at Texas Children's, and when children are aging, you know, becoming adults, some some of those people, their parents will need guardianships in order to help them make, or in order to make medical decisions going forward. Guardianship cases are in the probate courts, and as um, every presenter we've had has said, the probate court staff is wonderful. Uh, probate court is friendly court. Everyone, um, it, it's a nice place to be, and I mean that. And so just want to point out that um, if you take a guardianship case, it's rewarding because you're helping a parent care for their child. Um, the guardianship cases that we take are all uncontested. We verify that before 
beforehand. Uh, the courts are friendly. We will provide the templates and the forms that you need throughout the process. And also in order to be, uh, in order to represent a parent in a guardianship in Texas, you have to have a four hour certification uh, CLE and that costs I think $200. If you take one of our cases, we will provide that certification for free. So that's my shtick. And there was a question that I put off to the end, Jessica, and it was how does equitable adoption apply with intestate? Um, I will so say if that you have, if, I say, if you have an issue of equitable adoption, and then you probably need to go to the judicial determination of heirship route. I'm assuming there's going to be a contest with that. Um, because one of the issues on heirships is whether or not the person has ever had born to them ever adopted or ever held anybody else out to be their own child. I've, I've had it come up once in my eight years at HVL. Um, so it's not super common and I'm not exactly sure. Um, <laughs> come talk to us. Oh. <laughs> oh, no. um, send them back. So, <laughs> We have actually, we did last week, we did a, I'm sorry, I see the question is what's involved with the judicial determination of airship. Um, and just one second. Jessica, do you know how long the guardianship certification lasts? Sorry, I was, I was yeah. texting a coworker. Is it no, you're fine. So for the first, for the first one, it's two, for the first two, it's two years each. So it's two year um, validity. And then after that, it's every four years. Thank you. Thank you. So there's a question, what's involved with the judicial determination of airship? Um, last week we did a CLE and it's been recorded. Um, if you email me, oh, I don't think my email address is on this. If you email Ellie, um, whose email address is on this, or I can, hold on, I'll put my, my email in the chat. I will send you the link to watch the recording. Um, and there, it was, application uh, for letters of administration and determination of airship, but determination of airship is an application and ad litem gets appointed. Um, but we have a whole CLE in it from last week. Muniment of title was um, two weeks ago. So if you email me, I'll email you the link to that recording as well. Yeah, and the simple answer is if there's, an, if there's a will, a muniment of title may be your option. <laughs> Um, but what I will say is the stuff that you're talking about, um, the, the minimum title statute is kind of like the small state affidavit, the shortcut options for probate, the statutes, and I think Lisa will agree with me, are fairly specific on what qualifies and what doesn't. Um, so that's, that's good, at least. Um, also, for the small state affidavit, the Harris County Probate Court, like they have the form, but at the top of the form, they actually have a flow chart. And mm -hmm. I find it super helpful. It starts out like, is there a will? Has it been 30 days? What's the value of the estate excluding um, exempt property? Like, what are you transferring? If it's anything beyond a, beyond a homestead, stop. If it's going to anyone beside a, a, a spouse or a minor child, stop. And I, I like it. It's a lot of stops. Yeah, yeah well, and it's super helpful. Um, the other thing that the Harris County Probate Court has available to you um, is if you, and if, if you go on to the um, flow chart, I just saw, sorry, I'm seeing questions pop up. Just Google Harris County Probate Court, uh, small state affidavit, and it will come up in Google. I, I don't know the exact website, but it's on the probate court websites. Um, but they also have an intestacy chart, which I use all the time to explain to clients because I'm a visual person. Um, and it will, it, but it really will help explain to you if you're handling a pro bono case and need to see, to see it, to see the intestacy chart come out and, and what happens when. Yes, I agree. So I actually like the Travis County uh, intestacy chart, oh, and it's yep. something that I actually have printed out. Um, and I agree that if you poke around a little bit, if you Google Harris County small state affidavit, it will come right up. And also, if you just the various courts also have like different guides, like when there's a will, when there's a problem with the will, they have a lot of very helpful information. They're definitely trying to make this more accessible, the courthouse more accessible to I don't want to say everyone, but more people. Um, and, and Harris County, I think the bigger counties are doing a great job of that. I agree. Um, can I ask one question about a small estate affidavit, Jessica? Sure. If you have uh, a couple that are not married, so there's not a surviving spouse, but they have minor children, and one of the spouses dies, and that spouse was the homeowner, can you use a small, can the parent of the minor child who is not 
a surviving spouse still use the small estate affidavit to transfer it to the minor children? Is it a separate property? <laughs> yes, we're going to say it's separate property. Just to make it easy. Yes. Um, I, I, if, if it's only going to the minor children, again, I think anything that kind of comes outside of the norm of legal adoption, you know, formal marriage, you're probably best that's going to go to the judicial determination of airship route because of the chance that somebody might challenge it. So if the spouse had any claim to it, I'm just trying to envision a situation. Where oh, like say there is no spouse. Okay. If there were, yeah, yeah. If there was no spouse, then yes. If, can I throw so another I'm, kink in it then just for fun? Sure. Let's say there's another child outside of that relationship who is not a minor child. So that child can't take the real property via a small state affidavit because they're not a minor child. Can it still be used to transfer the portion owed to the minor children, to the minor children? I, I'm going to say, I'm going to, the way I'm going to phrase this is I don't think it's worth it to do that. I, I, I would never do it that way because I don't, I think it's going to cause problems in the back end, whether or not you can, maybe, but, you know, think about it this way um, is if you have a surviving spouse and the, the spouse has minor children from another marriage, or I'm sorry, adult children from another marriage. So it's community property, you know, half goes to the spouse, the adult children. It's, I don't think the, the statute, the legislature was intending it for those situations. The whole purpose of the small state affidavit was to give a more seamless route in very specific circumstances. Um, so I think when you're doing a mixed bag transfer, um, it's going to become more convoluted and more confusing. And quite frankly, when you list it in the small estate affidavit, I think a judge might kick it out. I think that's a fair, I think that's fair. I but like it's, your... gonna, it's gonna depend on your court, right? <laughs> um, I agree. Okay, um, I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, I wanna thank you so much for going through it and. And, and actually spending time on things that are quote unquote easy um, and explaining why maybe they're not always the easiest or maybe what they can and can't do. No, I appreciate you guys inviting me to do this. Okay, um, we will be emailing uh, the a, a copy of the slide deck to um, the people who registered afterwards. Um, I don't know if the chat can be saved. Um, since uh, someone did ask, I, I honestly don't know. I can have, uh, when this is emailed out, I can ask uh, our pro bono staff to um, include a link to the Travis County Intestacy chart and the Harris County Small Estate Affidavit Flow chart as well, if that would be helpful for y'all. Oh, I will save the chat. Okay, thank you, Heather, I didn't know that. Okay, it's done. Um, thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording now.